Now, today, I want us to kind of hit the refresh button and uh, to take a look at some essential behaviors of the early church. Now, that's just good practice, to be reminded of our purpose and our calling, to always be recalibrating to what Jesus intended the church to be. Now, he made it clear what the foundation would be when Peter proclaimed him to be, you know, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God, to which Jesus replied, on this rock I will build my church. And so that's our foundation. And when the church is built on this rock, the church really flourishes. Jesus also made it clear, it's not our job to build the church. That's his responsibility. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. Our role is just simply to clarify the foundation to point people to Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, and he will build the church. When that happens, the church is not just a, a, a successful, uh, we need to swap? Okay, awesome, man, good job. The, the church is, it will obviously be more than just a, a successful organization. It will be a healthy organism. And so I want us to zoom in on that early church in Jerusalem, that little church plant. After Jesus was resurrected, he told his followers to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. And so when that happened at Pentecost, about 120 followers, that little church plant became a mega church in one day. Peter preached, 3,000 people responded. And then we see in the pages that follow in the book of Acts, just some behaviors of this early church. Look in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says this. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions uh, to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And verse 47 says they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. You see that? He's building his church, those who were being saved. And so I want to extract a couple of things here, okay? First of all, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, who were the apostles? Did you guys know there's a difference in disciples and, and apostles? Did you know there were more than 12 disciples? Yeah, there were many more, hundreds more. I mean, I mean a disciple is a learner, is a, is a follower, and there were many disciples. Some of those disciples were fickle. When Jesus really clarified what it meant to follow him, in John 6, it says many of those disciples just stopped following him. But the, the apostles were different. The, an apostle is someone who is sent, a messenger, an ambassador. And Jesus designated 12 of his disciples as apostles. Uh, we find that roster in Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. Take a look at this. It says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. He spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also designated as apostles. Now, here's the roster. Simon, whom he called Peter. His brother, Andrew. James, John, Philip, Bartholomew. Matthew, Thomas. James, son of Alphaeus. Simon, who was called the Zealot. And Judas, the son of James. And then Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Some of these guys shared names together, you know, so they're designated as there was James, the brother of John. There's James, son of Alphaeus. There were two Judases. I guess the plural is Judai. Is that right, Matt? <laughs> okay, so there were two Judases, Judas Iscariot and, and, and uh, Judas, who was later called, uh, changed his, his name, uh, to, uh, which, which was probably a good idea uh, to not be uh, associated with Judas Iscariot. Now, all of these, uh, these apostles... Uh, you know, we know Jesus was about 30 years old. Peter was probably the oldest. Uh, he was married. We know he was married because he had a mother-in-law. That's how you get one of those. You have to get married to get one. And uh, the other guys were, you know, likely teenagers, maybe early 20-somethings. And so uh, uh, some of these guys were fishermen. There were at least two pair of brothers, James and John and Peter and Andrew. Uh, Jesus told these fishermen, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Well, some of these guys are already doing that just naturally because Andrew was a fisher of men. He brought his brother Peter to Jesus. And Philip was a fisher of men. He told Bartholomew about 
Jesus. Then there was Matthew, who was a tax collector. Now, this is interesting. All right? The Jews, for the most part, had a great dislike for tax collectors. And Matthew is a part of these Jewish men because there was also Simon the Zealot. Who were the Zealots? <laughs> well, they were passionate Jewish nationalists. They hated Rome. Matthew worked for Rome. And so all of this dynamic is so interesting to me. There's Thomas. You remember Thomas? Uh, we, call, we, we know him as what? What Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Because after Jesus was resurrected, Thomas said, look, i got to see this to believe this. In fact, he even went a little further. i got to put my, my hands, you know, where the nail prints were. And then Jesus appeared before him and invited him to do that. And then afterwards, Thomas makes this great confession of faith. What did he say? My Lord and my God. And so this is that band of apostles. There was, there was uh, Judas Iscariot. Iscariot means man from Kerioth. Kerioth was in uh, Judea, so all the other disciples, apostles were Galileans. Judas was a Judean. Judas gave three years of his life to Jesus, but we know he never gave his heart. Never gave his heart. He just couldn't reconcile what he thought the Messiah would be with who Jesus was. And so he betrayed him, and then he took his life. And then we need to throw Paul, the apostle, into the mix. Paul was uh, very educated. He was a Pharisee. He was actually persecuting Christians, but he's on the Damascus Road, and Jesus appeared before him. Paul said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting, and Paul's life completely changed. He, he was given a new name from Saul to Paul, and he went from being the persecutor to being the persecuted. And so Paul even uh, affirmed his own calling. He knew in his writings in Galatians chapter 1, for instance, he says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men or made by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So this is, these are the apostles. The early church was devoted to their teaching. Why did these young men teach? Well, first of all, they were given a mandate from Jesus. They were given a mission. They were commissioned by Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. You guys know this. He says to, to his apostles, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And look at this, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And so they were just following their mandate. They were just fulfilling their mission. And they were compelled by what they had experienced. Man, this is more than a job. This is more than academics. When they were told by the authorities, stop talking about Jesus, stop preaching about Jesus, you know what they said in Acts? We can't help but talk about what we've seen and heard. You see, it just flowed out of their heart. They were, they were compelled by what they'd experienced. And they were driven by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised them in Acts 1, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. This is what got them out of bed to do what they did. They taught because they were driven by the Holy Spirit. But here's something we really need to see for us today, not just for the early church, but an essential behavior for us. Teaching was an essential element of God's plan for a healthy church. Take a look at this in Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11. It says, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You see, God's Word has always been the main course for the church, okay? Without it, the church will be malnourished and weak. Now, what did these guys teach? The church was devoted to the teaching. What did they teach? Well, obviously, they taught what Jesus taught. Uh, they taught repentance from sin and faith in Jesus. You could say the entire New Testament is what they taught. Out of 27 books in the New Testament, we know that Peter, John, and Paul contributed most of them. And Paul, in his letter to Timothy, said, Look, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for what? Teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. It's always interesting to me as you study these guys, to, to, take, to take a look at how they taught. Uh, that, that's, uh, 
That's important to me as a teacher because I want to learn from, from these guys, all right? We know they taught with boldness. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you, you read, uh, you know, Peter's uh, uh, sermon in Acts, you know, when the Holy Spirit came. Man, he is bold. He's not pulling any punches. He is not concerned about being politically correct. He is just coming right down Main Street. We know in the letters of Paul that he doesn't shy away from tough and difficult issues. And so there was boldness. But listen to this. There is a difference in boldness and arrogance, right? And there's a difference in confidence, which we must have, and cockiness. They not only taught with boldness, they also taught with humility. We see this in Scripture in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. In chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 12, he says, Look, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. You know what he's saying? He's saying, look, school is still in session for me. I haven't figured all of this stuff out. Now, we need, we need a little more of that, don't we? Because it doesn't matter how long we've been following Jesus or how educated we are, isn't there still more to learn? As long as we have breath in our body, we need to have humility so we can be teachable. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, we have a little too much swagger. We're a little too overconfident that we're cocky. We're a little too uh, bold that we become, we become brash and we become arrogant. Uh, someone said that, uh, you know, we need to have the swagger gospeled out of us, you know. And so when we're presenting it, man, we're confident, but we're not doing it in a way that says, I figured this out and I'm right and you're wrong. We need to present it with boldness, but also humility. We see these apostles taught with authenticity. I, I love Peter's comments in, in uh, one of his letters uh, about Paul's letters. Peter said, uh, he said, look, there are some things that Paul writes that uh, are just hard to understand. And I'm so glad he said that because I feel the same way. I'll be reading Paul's letters. I'm going, what is he talking about? And Paul himself said in 1 Corinthians 7, he's, he, uh, when he's talking about marriage, he says, now to the married, I give this command. Then he clarifies. Now, this is not me. This is the Lord. This is a biblical, this is a spiritual principle that comes from God. But then he said, now to the rest, I'm going to say this. And he clarified, now, this is really me, not so much the Lord. This is what I've experienced, how I'm applying it. And that's just authentic. And I'm so grateful for their authenticity. I used to think when I was a new follower of Jesus that Paul had it all together. And, man, he was like super Christian. But then I read something he said about uh, how he taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that changed my trajectory as a pastor and as a teacher. Philippians 2 verse 1, Paul says this, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. How many of you can identify with that? When you think about sharing Christ or teaching or standing up talk, weakness, fear, much trembling. Well, that was Paul. He says, my message, my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Man, we need that today when we plant churches because too often churches are planted on the personality of the lead guy. And it's so much deeper than that, so much deeper. We need to teach with boldness, humility, but also with authenticity. Uh, when I was um, uh, studying the Bible and, and uh, in my degree, uh, you know, in Greek and Hebrew and systematic theology, all of that. I remember some professors who loved Jesus, loved God's Word, and many times in class as they were teaching, they would read Scripture and just have to stop and pause because they were weeping over the principles they were reading. Man, don't we need more of that? Now, how did these people respond to the teaching? Well, clearly, with devotion. Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves. But it's kind of like what Jeremiah the prophet experienced. In Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, Your words were found, and I, I ate them. I gobbled them up. And your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. Do you feel that way about God's word? I mean, do you just enjoy it? It's like, man, I'm hungry for this stuff. I can't get enough of this. 
David said this in Psalm 119, verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them they have preserved my life. So the people responded with devotion, but also with obedience. They heard it, and they applied it. James, chapter 1, he says, hey, be doers of the word and not just hearers only and deceive yourself. The Bible is clear that obedience is actually evidence of our salvation. How do you know you're a true follower of Jesus? Well, you want to do what he says. Uh, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, uh, he writes, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Now, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word then love for God is truly made complete in him. Look at this. This is how we know that we are in him. This is how we know we're saved. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. What does that mean? If you have never in your life had any de desire to obey Jesus, you are not saved. It's that clear. Now, we know we're saved by grace, right? It's not by our track record. It's not by how, how well we obey. None of us are going to be perfect in this at all. That's why I, I love the description of this church. Uh, check it out sometimes on your website. It says, you strive to be a people who live at the intersection of grace and truth. You see, the Bible tells us in John that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Now, you don't have to switch off grace to access truth. And you don't have to switch off truth to access grace. They're always working together. And we want to strive to live in that intersection. You see, if you really have experienced God's grace, then you're going to want to obey Jesus. You're going to want to follow him. And as you try to follow him and you realize, man, this is tough, and you fail, aren't you thankful for God's grace? That no matter how much you mess up, he's not going to, He's not going to kick you out of his kingdom. We live at the intersection of grace and truth. You see, this is more than just behavior modification. This is about transformation. Too often, we try to work from the outside in. Someone said, we, we try to clean the fish before we catch them. <laughs> well, if we choose to follow Jesus, then it's an inside job. His Holy Spirit is beginning to change us from the inside out. And so, why do we obey him? Well, because we love him and we follow him. Jesus himself said to the Jews who had decided to follow him, he said, you're truly my disciples if you continue in my word. <laughs> so it's easy to say I'm a disciple, but here's how you'll know if you continue in my word. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And then I love this one. He says, hey, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you? Now, these are just kind of put up or shut up kind of statements, aren't they? I mean, they're just indicators of true followers of Jesus. Because we love him, we will obey him. This early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching, and we need that today. The second thing we see in Acts chapter 2 is they were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to fellowship. Now, what is fellowship? This is a word we toss around a lot. We kind of reduced it to, you know, uh, you know a, a party or an event uh, I remember when I was on church staff, we'd always advertise things, and we'd say, join us for an evening of food, fun, and fellowship. Anybody seen that before? Okay, and then we have fellowship halls. We have a Friday night fellowship. Some churches, you know, that's their name, fellowship something church, you know. Well, fellowship is so much more than that. Uh, I never like to throw out around original Greek, but this one's important because the original word is so much more descriptive than our English translation. When it says they were devoted to fellowship, that original word is a word that looks like this. It's called koinonia, koinonia. Now, it's interesting. Koinonia was actually the final word in the 2018 Scripps National Spelling Bee. And an eighth-grade student from McKinney, Texas, correctly spelled K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, koinonia. You know what koinonia is? Oh, man, koinonia is this selfless immersion into each other's lives. The scriptures use it to describe our relationship with each other, but even before that, it describes our relationship with Jesus. Uh, I actually saw a sign recently for the name of the church. It was called Koinonia Fellowship Church. Now, I had to laugh. I thought, that's double the fellowship here, you know. 
But koinonia is, is this intimate connection or association. It's a, a joint participation. It's intercommunication. Hey, it's so much more than these little transactional drive-bys in the hall, like, hey, how's it going? How, how's it work? How are the kids? Awesome. Hey, how about them strobes? I mean, it's so much deeper than that. Nothing wrong with that, but it goes so much deeper than that. So much more than just kind of scrolling and liking and harding and scrolling and liking and harding, okay? So much more than that. It's an intercommunication. It's true communion. It's authentic community. It is tangible. It's even measurable because that same word is used to describe an actual joint uh, collection or contribution. Uh, Acts chapter 242 is the first time it was used in the New Testament. They were devoted to the apostles' Uh, teaching and to fellowship, koinonia. Look at this, 1 John 1, verse 6. says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, okay, describing our relationship with Jesus, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Relationship with Jesus, relationship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. In Romans 15, 26, same word translated differently. Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor. This was tangible. It was measurable. It was koinonia. It was that kind of fellowship. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 says, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership, your fellowship, your koinonia in the gospel. And 1 Corinthians 10, 16 is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ, is not the bread which we break a sharing in, in the body of Christ. So th this fellowship is so much deeper than we typically use it. The value of fellowship is this, man, we, we can't grow without it. We cannot grow unless we're planted. Uh, you know, typically our, our, our habit, our behavior is to kind of float and, to, you know, to different churches and just kind of audit the class and kind of observe, you know, and, you know, you may be at this place for, you know, one week and another place another week or this place for, you know, six months or a year then another place. Well, you're not going to be able to grow like that. You've got to find a place and be planted. Psalm 92 verse 12 says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They'll be planted in the house of the Lord and they will flourish in the courts of our God. And in their old age, they're still going to bear fruit. They're going to be fresh and green. Fellowship protects us. It protects us. Uh, it, in Peter's letter, he said, look, the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you guys ever watch uh, like National Geographic or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Discovery Channel? All right, so you see these predators, and they're stalking their prey, and if there's a herd, you know what they want to do? They want to get one of those animals away from the herd because then they know that's, that's how they can have them for lunch, have them for dinner. And if you're out there by yourself, not connected to the herd, you're not going to be protected. That's a very dangerous place to be in. Fellowship heals us. In James chapter 5, it tells us to confess our sins one to another, pray for each other that you might be healed. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not just going to tell you my stuff unless I really know you and trust you. I'm not going to crack open my chest unless we have some relational equity. And so we need this kind of deeper fellowship to where we know each other, we trust each other, and then I might be able to share my heart with you. And Scripture says that's how we're healed. We need that to stay fresh and to be healed. Fellowship balances us. It tells, tells us plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Man, I need, the pers I need a perspective bigger than mine. Uh, all of us are smarter than any one of us. And so we need to speak into each other's life. Fellowship sharpens us. There's a verse we use a lot in, from Proverbs 27, especially in ministry to men. Uh, you know this verse. I'll start it. You finish it. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man what? Sharpens another. Okay. Well, here's how that doesn't work. As beneficial as it is for all of us to be in this auditorium, sitting in a, in a seat, facing the stage, listening to a guy talk, as beneficial as that is, that's not how you sharpen iron. We don't get all the pieces of iron in seats facing forward. You want to sharpen iron? You've got to press them together. You've got to press them together. And so we're going to need more than just a classroom experience. We're going to need the lab of life and do life together, and that's how we're sharpened. And fellowship, 
relationship sustains us. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are doing, but encouraging one another all the more as the day of Christ's return is approaching. True fellowship is, is uh, modeled for us in Scripture. There was this little church in uh, Philippi, this little um, um, uh, Macedonian uh, city. It, it, the church started out small. I mean, there was Lydia, and there was the jailer, the Philippian jailer. Uh, but we can see from Paul's letter, this little church was healthy, and it flourished. Uh, we read it earlier as part of our worship. I want you to look at it again in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. So we see this unity in this healthy church. Unity that's part of true fellowship. And the focus is always on what we have in common. See, in this room, there, there are lots of different preferences when it comes to music or food or clothes or vacation. But our big common denominator is Jesus, right? He is our rock. That's our, and that's what we have in common. Too often we're polarized by, by labels and a lot of times it's, you know, my church is better than your church. That's just like a little boy saying, my dad can beat your dad up, okay? I mean, you need to get over that, all right? We are unified by what we have in common, that is Jesus. This is something Jesus prayed for in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest. He prayed for his apostles and for us. In chapter 17 of John, he says, I'm praying that they might be brought to complete unity, and then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. One of the greatest proofs that Jesus is who he says he is is this undeniable unity that people can have who come from just opposite walks of life. You see it in the apostles with the tax collector and, and the zealot. Uh, you see it today. Uh, uh, the content we created for men is being used a lot in prisons, and so I'm getting invitations to go into prisons and so I remember my first trip into Folsom Prison in North, uh, Northern California. Man, you could see these guys who were like former skinheads and neo-Nazis in the room with uh, African Americans and Hispanics, men who would be at odds at each other, at war with each other outside of that place. But you could look in their eyes and you could see this grace of God that was tangible. And they were hugging each other and calling each other brother. You can't, you can't explain it other than this is Jesus, right? In fact, the guards pulled the team over to the side and said, you guys have got to keep doing this. The guards said, we've seen a shift in the culture in this part of the prison because of what God is doing in the lives of these men. Man, that is a remarkable when we see this kind of unity because the Bible says we are like-minded. We have the mind of Christ. We're one in spirit. And that spirit, you know what it is? Paul said the first Adam was merely human, but Jesus was a life-giving spirit. Hey, does that describe you? A life-giving spirit? We're not talking life of the party here, but we're talking about this. Do you breathe life into relationships, or do you suck life out of relationships? Are you a life-giving spirit, or do you suck the life out of the room? Hey, here's a great clarifying question. Do you think people look forward to your presence? or your absence. <laughs> as we're following Christ, as we're engaged in fellowship with him and with each other, true koinonia, more than just surface relationships, man, we're one in spirit, and we're one in purpose. We're all about pointing people to Jesus. And we also see humility in this church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain uh, conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. So clearly these apostles taught with humility, boldness and humility. They modeled it, and he's teaching them. This ought to be the way you live with each other, in humility. Humility equals relatability. It helps us to be more connected to other people because we're listening to others. We're tuned in not just to what we want, but what's really going on in the lives of others. 
Humility always equals teachability. Uh, and some of God's greatest hits are like Micah chapter 6. You know, what does the Lord require uh, from you? To act justly, walk, uh, and, to, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly. Uh, in Isaiah, uh, Scripture says, The one I esteem is he, he who's humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Humility. And then we see this beautiful participation in Philippians 2, verse 4. Paul says, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Uh, Paul described the body of Christ, which we are a part of, as being not unlike a physical body. In his letter to the church in Corinth, look at what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. See, in this room, many of you have gifts that I don't have and that your pastors don't have. And that's how God designed the church. We work together. We participate with each other like a physical body. And then he says this, so it is with Christ, and if one part suffers, <laughs> every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you know that's true, right? Let's say you wake up in the middle of the night, and you're thinking, I don't need to turn the lights on to navigate to where I'm going. I can do this in the dark. And you try, you're trying to do that, but I don't know, your radar's down. You try to make the turn, and your little toe gets caught on some, you know, corner of a hard dresser or some metal bed frame. Anybody ever experienced this before? Okay. Now, the Word of God, Scripture says, if one part suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. So what, is your, what does your body do? Well, all the members are connected. They're participating. The face responds. Can't do much, but the face responds. <clears throat> okay, that's not helpful, but that's all I can do. The hands can do more. They have a different gift, okay? They're equipped to do more. So the hands do this. <laughs> this leg is on the other side of the body. I suppose it could hop off and do what it wants to, but no, it's connected. It's participating. It wants to help, so it does this. <laughs> but what's happening in the body of Christ is this. When one part is suffering, if we're really connected, can't you just sense there's something's not right? And it draws you to that person to try to figure out what it is, right? And these face-to-face -face intimate connections we have, you're actually hurting with them, aren't you? When one part suffers, all the other parts suffer with it. Then it says, when one part is honored, all the other parts rejoice with it. Uh, Paul says that in Romans chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 15. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. I don't know about you, but personally, it's easier for me to uh, mourn with those who are hurting. You know, to be empathetic, to be sensitive to that, it's harder for me sometimes to actually be genuinely happy when God chooses to bless someone. Anybody ever experienced that before? Is it just me? <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, things like, yeah, I'm really excited you got a new house. <laughs> I wonder how many people, how many families live in that house, you know? <laughs> Would Jesus live in a house like that? Hey, you know, I'm yeah, excited about your new job. Yeah, praise God. Tell me, I'm still praying, still hoping. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad that he asked you out. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be home with the parents, you know, making quilts. <laughs> Sometimes it really is hard to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. But the more in fellowship we are with this unity we have in the Spirit of Christ, God just gives us this ability to be absolutely happy and not be jealous. We're not perfect at that, but we move more towards that. Well, here's the thing I want to finish with today. If we're really devoted to the teaching of God's Scriptures, His Word, His timeless principles, and we're devoted to real fellowship, that deep inner communication and connection and participation. God will equip us to, to laugh with each other in the good times. And man, I love those good times. I've got some friends, and we're so connected. Sometimes we laugh so hard, our stomach hurts, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I love those times. But then there's other times, but He will allow us to walk with each other in the difficult times. And we all have those. But then there are times when God will equip us to hold each other in the terrible times. 
And man, we need that. And you don't want to be away from the herd without a connection when those times happen. Um, back when I was a student pastor in Greenville, South Carolina in my 20s, um, I, I was only there for about two and a half, three years, but really connected in true community and fellowship with this church. It's Edwards Road Baptist Church. I was a student pastor, but man, I connected not only with students, but families, and we've been friends ever since. Uh, I actually live with a family, uh, the, the McCurries, and uh, they had two sons, Paul and Jerry. They were in my student group. And so they, you know, they grew up and went to college and businessmen and all that. Well, several years ago, about, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, my mom had a uh, massive stroke and failed all the tests for any kind of uh, hope for rehab. And so she was in Birmingham. My sister lived there in Birmingham. I'd flown out. And so they were just going to move her from the regular hospital room to kind of a holding room until we could figure out some extended care. She only lived for another month. We're grateful for God's mercy in that. We prayed for that. But while I was there by myself, waiting for instructions to get all of her cards and flowers and notes and stuff from that room, and she's not able to communicate at all, man, it was overwhelming. But I looked down the hallway, and I saw this silhouette of a guy. The sun was shining through the, the window. And I knew immediately, that's Jerry McCurry from South Carolina. And we connected back when he was a student in my student ministry. But we've been connected ever since. Somehow, he was on business somewhere in Georgia, and he just heard about what was going on with my mom and my life. And he hurt with us. And he just rearranged his whole schedule and drove to Birmingham. And he walked up and he says, hey, man, what do you need? <laughs> and I said, how about let's start with a, a hamburger and some fries? And he said, got it. And he was just there with me, right? Now, many of us in this room have experienced similar circumstances. You got to have that. You got to have that connection so we can hold each other in the terrible times. It starts with a devotion to Jesus. And then from that, there's a devotion to his word, his teaching, and a devotion to fellowship. Let's pray about that right now, okay? Thank you, God, so much for your scriptures. They're just so alive and so full and inspire us today, God. We're so grateful for that. We pray that these things would be uh, so much of a reality in our life today that those who are skeptical outside this room and other churches like this, that people who are skeptics, would see us in the real world just simply loving each other the way you designed us to love each other, that that would be so compelling and so irresistible that then when we tell them about you, that they'll listen because they've already seen proof. We pray for that, God. And I pray for some who are here this morning, maybe out of habit, and we're grateful for that. But God, I pray that you'll take us all deeper to, to kind of hit the refresh button again today to recalibrate to your original design for us as a church and as your followers. We pray for that in Jesus' name.